Hey everybody, it's Bert Suzanka of the rock band from Huntington Beach called The Ziggins. And you are listening to Bradley's House Podcast. Enjoy it. It's the best. Hey guys, welcome back. Come on in and make yourself at home as you should when you're a guest in Bradley's house. I'm your co-host, Jared Orr. She is the executive director of the Knoll Family Foundation. And just kind of an all-around good person. Our host, Ms. Kelly Knoll. Kelly, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jared? Well, Kelly, typically, you know, you would say like, hey, you know, things aren't great, but at least I got my health. But Here's the deal. When you're stuck in the house for three days because of excessive snow, as I have been, during those three days, you watch a lot of TV, a lot of TV. And one of the things that I'm noticing is like having your health. eh, I don't know. Like I just saw the guy in the diabetes commercial. He was jumping out of an airplane. Uh, Arthritis (laughs) commercial. That guy, he's on a bowling team. He's hanging out with his friends. He's having a good time. Uh, And then like, I'm just sitting here, like my knees and elbows don't hurt. My, you know, blood sugar's fine, but I'm not like mountain biking or doing anything cool like they are. So not living um, your best life. I don't, yeah, I, so now I'm not so sure about the whole health thing, but on a, on, a, on a plus note, a day that I've been waiting for for 22 years is happening right now as Tom Brady has announced his retirement from the NFL. So ah, to say no way. Tom Brady has announced <laughs> his retirement from the NFL, so to say that I'm having a good day would be an understatement, especially because we are recording another awesome episode of Bradley's House, which I always get excited for. Kelly, who's our guest today? Well, clearly it's a historic day on many fronts, but I'm super excited about our guest today. We have Wes Gear. He's a professional guitar player, songwriter, recording artist, producer. He toured for nearly a decade with a band he founded, Ed P.E., before getting sober, and later he was a touring guitarist with multi-platinum rock band Korn. He also founded the nonprofit Rock to Recovery, because clearly Wes does not sit still for very long. Um, And Rock to Recovery is an amazing program that partners with other treatment programs to bring music to people in recovery. Um, And most importantly, he's a member of the board of directors for the Null Family Foundation. Please welcome Wes Gear. Wes, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I always like to start these things off by saying there was a time when nobody wanted to hear a word I had to say. <laughs> so the fact anybody wants to talk is cool by me. My, how times have changed, huh? Mm-hmm. So are you a Tom Brady fan or not? I couldn't tell if that gasp of horror was because you were a fan or not a fan. Uh, well, I mean, he must be acknowledged as the greatest of all time. Stats show it. Having said that, as a longtime Pittsburgh Steelers fan and loather of anybody who dominates for too long, I, well, it's just, it's big news. It's sporting news. He's a, yeah. you know what I mean? So, uh, and he was playing at a high level. So it was, it's a little bit shocking. I think that was my gasp. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And Jarrett, are you are you not a fan? Is that why you're happy that he's retiring? Uh, I hate Tom Brady. Okay. Um, I, I I always have, but I'm a Giants fan, so we we beat him in two Super oh. Bowls. So I can't yeah. really be too upset about it. Um, but yes, he he does have to be acknowledged as as the goat for sure. I mean. The guy's 44 years old, and he's still playing professional football, and he led the league in yards and in, uh, in touchdowns, or excuse me, had his best statistical career ever. Um, wow. It, it's, it's really crazy that he walked away at, at this point, um, but I'm happy. Yeah, it's, he's had an impressive career. I don't mean to sound like I actually know that. I just The fact that I know his name and I'm not a football fan – Means he yeah. must be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he he won he won seven Super Bowls, so you know. Okay, yeah, that's good. I feel like that's really good. So, Wes, 
tell us a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. I know, I know some of the, the bigger picture things, the things that you've done, as I mentioned with, uh, you know, rock to recovery. And I want to get more into that in a bit, but tell us how you got started in music, where you grew up, all that good stuff. All right. Well, you got a few minutes, huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Cali. Uh, okay. You know, I had a musical family, and uh, uh, you know, my grandfather was the uh, uh, musical director of a church back east in New England. So very oh, wow. traditional. Uh -huh. Yeah, he played the organ, and my grandma played violin, and and uh, with a conductor who actually worked for the Boston Pop Symphony, and wow. So I was surrounded by classical music my whole life, and that was just kind of the norm. And uh, so probably in my ears, definitely, and in my genes, at some uh, on some level. And um, uh, but I, I, as the story goes, you know that was kind of the normal music. Then I once heard my brother. Uh, play smoke on the water you know mm. dar, dar, dance kind of like cutting mm -hmm. and edgy and it has that flat five down air was like kind of spooky and i was like whoa what's that and that <laughs> sowed the seed of wanting to play guitar and then you fast forward to like uh you know the shredders the eddie van halens and randy Rhodes, who were doing all these like by the way they were doing a lot of classical type stuff with the tapping whereas like arpeggios so grab my ear and i wanted to learn how to make those sounds. And that started my journey into guitar. Um, you know, my parents divorced at five and then we moved a lot. And my mom was, you know, working hard as a nurse and going to nursing school and doing all she could to create a great life for us. Nonetheless, I, the, the guitar was my best friend, you know, mm -hmm. and then when I went to a new high school, all I did is play guitar and that's how I made my friends. And then you add in, being super insecure and then i you know just started smoking weed because it was an easy way to find my little posse of the punks and the stoners and the you know whatever the outcasts you know that's where i felt comfortable and let's smoke weed and play guitar and talk about dead kennedys and all that kind of stuff and i don't mean mm -hmm. literally i met the punk band you know yeah. so uh, <laughs> right yeah so that that's kind of how it went and uh and as a as a an aspiring alcoholic, uh, I was you know once I was in high school, I really couldn't live life without marijuana. Like I ditched school to smoke it, came to every class stoned, and uh, and uh, then my I had a stepbrother, and he uh, he <laughs> by the way, not to get all heavy right out the gate, he just passed away. Oh. Last week, suddenly, we're trying to find out what happened. He relocated from Hawaii back to Mountain View up NorCal, and uh, he was sick. I was talking, he's a year and a half old, and he was talking to him on the phone. And he's like, Yeah, I got a horrible headache. We thought he had COVID. I was like, Yeah, I had that COVID headache too. You know, maybe go to urgent care. He said, Ah, you know, they'll just send me home to work through this virus. And I said, yeah, but, you know, you should probably still go. Then we did, you know, check on him the next day. Hey, man, how are you doing? No text back. Ah, oh, he's probably just sleeping it off. And then a few days pass. I'm like, we haven't heard from Kim. And we find we had to have the police do a wellness check. Like, we have oh, no. serve, and then they found him in there. <sighs> uh, uh, he was a he was a partier, but I don't think that was a uh, part of it. I, I think you know he had some high blood pressure, left the weight, and so uh, rest in peace, Kim Alexander Brokaw. Uh, wow, you know, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I I don't process death well, especially when it's like he's been. I haven't seen him much. I saw him around the holidays, but it's like hard to even fathom. Like he's gone. What? Yeah. He's not yeah. on this planet. Definitely some sadness, and uh, so so he was my stepbrother, and he was a partier, and uh, I, you know, nobody made me do anything, but I'd come home, you know, at lunch to smoke a little weed and play a little guitar. I was obsessed by the guitar, and then he'd be like, "Well, here, why don't you put some of this on your weed? What is that? Oh, it's a little cocaine." And so at fifteen, I'm going back to drafting class after smoking cocoa puffs, as I think that's what they called them back then. Oh gosh, that was my. <laughs> <laughs> I got kicked out of high school at 15 for smoking weed. And, you know, it's funny when we get into recovery, we hear all these sayings and slogans or 
things. But if you really think about it, a lot of the stuff we can apply to our own life. When I got kicked out of school for smoking weed, I never once thought about quitting weed. I was mm. like, well, better go live with my dad now. And uh, yeah, it went on like that for uh, for quite some time. You know, looking back now, you know, I was a good kid. My My dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. My stepdad was a cop. My family, in many ways, was great. But I was suffering with that, like, where do I fit in vibe? And I just found ease and comfort in being stoned. I love the backyard parties. You know, I was, I hit puberty late. So I, I just felt like not as manly as the other kids. And so drinking beer was the great um, equalizer, you know, gave sure. me a lot of courage. And I was always searching out of myself to outside of myself to feel better. So if I could get a buzz on and find a girl who liked me, I'm like, okay, maybe life's okay. And, uh, and so, yeah, I can't blame it on my parents. I think the divorce was jarring emotionally though at the time i didn't know about it moving was probably challenging but we don't blame like our disease or addiction or any of it on that but we have to acknowledge it as stuff to be addressed or maybe contributing factors you know sure. and, uh, and so uh, yeah so i kicked out of high school moved in with my dad and then i had a buddy who had a pickup truck and he was older and uh bob hollywood was his name and he loved the cocaine, and of course, I had to do the cocaine with him as a good friend. But if he asked me at the time, I'd be like, I don't really even like cocaine. Mm. And what that shows is kind of like the powerlessness, right? Of like, I was doing stuff I really didn't want to because I couldn't say no. And, you know, again, at the time when it was happening, it didn't seem like anything. But now looking back at like my history, my MO, right? How I mm. operate is like, Oftentimes I was drinking and using, even though I didn't want to and being out of control and is causing me problems in my life. And, and I would never think like a normal person, right? Oh, I drank too much wine last night. I got a headache. I, okay. I shouldn't do that again. I never thought that, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? uh, just keep going. Um, you know, fast forward through some years, I was trying to control and enjoy my drinking and using, you know, like any, any, aspiring alcoholic try to kind of like uh make sense of it you don't want to give it up right yeah, and uh yeah. and and i had all these crappy bands and then i had the, i was living in yorba linda at the time and uh i just i saw like you know the 80s thing die you know the sunset strip all the glam stuff that thing just died and everybody got sick of that kind of like type of music and the facade and then 90s music came in, which is dark and edgy and kind of like telling more real stories. And uh, so I had this new band and that was the beginning ahead. And I said, you guys, we got to get, excuse me, we got to get down to the beach. That's where it's at. I just had this feeling. So as soon as I could, actually, my dad kicked me out at 18. That's where that was going. As he's ah. like, son, every night you don't come home. I never know when I'm going to get the call that. You know, mm. that call, but no parent wants to get, get out of here. So he kicked me out. I flunked out of college, uh, junior college. I think I went to three classes. So my dad was uh, not happy with my performance as a young adult. And then I lived in my car and couch surfed and whatever. And then I moved down to the beach and into Huntington beach and uh, had the early formations of head. And uh, that was a special time. There was, um, there was, you know, Sublime was coming out. I got turned on to Corn um, in the early days playing clubs and just seeing that magic and the Deftones and uh, mm. Shrinky Dinks, which ended up being Sugar Ray. Um, there was such a scene down there of of bands. I mean, I used to watch Sublime. They used to play, it was uh, El Ranchito and Beach and Adams on the tile floor. Like nice. on a Sunday at two in the afternoon when everybody's drunk and it doesn't even sound that good. And we're like, oh, these, this band's kind of cool. But at the time, you know, 40 ounces of freedom was out and you'd pull in the gas station and people were bumping that all over town. They were like mm. local legends. And as a musician, I'm like, this is like a local band, but this is legendary stuff. And uh, when I was forming head, I was trying to figure out what we wanted to do. We wanted to fuse hip hop punk and all the stuff back when not everybody was doing it now you know it, it got a it left a bad taste in everybody's mouth when it got all into 
rap metal and stuff. But at the time, we were edgy and doing that. And I was like, I want to put a DJ in our rock band. And at the mm. time, nobody had one. Death yeah. Dogs didn't tour with a DJ. Incubus didn't tour with a DJ. The BC Boys did it, but they weren't a rock band, you know? And right. so I grabbed DJ Product. Yeah. And at a local club, I heard him spin punk and then go into Stevie Wonder and then go into some huh. hip hop. I'm like, this guy gets it. And so yeah. he came in our band and for anybody listening, he's like, a you know, Sublime was his family and uh, he played on Garden Grove on that track. And, and so he was turning us on to Sublime and he came from, you know, basically the streets of Long Beach. Um, and he brought a lot of edginess and art to what we were doing and the fact that he wanted to join uh, this vision I had for Head uh, was really quite, I felt like, uh, you know, I don't know, it was, it felt so good that an artist of his type would want to get on board with us because we were kind of a mishmash of punk and post glam and things that DJ Product probably wasn't a huge fan of, but artistically we had some good energies there. But, um, you know, as the story goes, um, I had kind of just got it down to Weekend Warrior, pitchers of beer and, and uh, you know, shots of tequila. And I ca came home in the beginning ahead, you know, way too drunk, supposed to go to rehearsal and walked into my roommates and they were snorting something. And uh, and I caught them. And, what, what is that? And they told me it was heroin. And I was so hammered. I was like, oh, I want to try that. I always want to try that. And then I did it. And next thing you know, I got my buddy to drive the Too Drunk West to rehearsal. And I'm playing guitar in the car. And I wrote like two songs on the way to rehearsal. It's like, man, I thought heroin was supposed to mail you out. I've got great energy. He's like, you idiot. That was meth. It's like, oh, wow. Geez. So then I got all in the meth. And now head, I start writing. Because in the beginning, we, we weren't very good. We were kind of lost for a direction. All of a sudden, I'm writing all these songs, and we have record labels coming out, and you couldn't tell me I had a problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm doing meth, staying up all night, writing music. Black Flies is giving us gear, putting us in ads, you know? Because we, we as musicians had a bunch of crappy bands that nobody cared about. And when you're doing art, people start caring, you know? I think it's important to point that out, too, because for a lot of people who struggle with addiction, maybe it's a mom who drinks too much wine after work or a college kid who snorts Adderall to have the energy to get through this insane schedule. On some level, it's working, right? Right. It's given us something. You know, maybe it's a liquid courage, whatever. And so for me, it felt like it was working. But uh, another one of those cheesy sayings i heard is like you know alcohol gave me wings and then it took away the sky <laughs> i heard mm. a woman say that once but it's true like at first you know meth i'm like tweaking out literally on drum machines learning how to produce writing songs all night and playing a club and watching the club go berserk and record labels flying out you know, it used to be they would only hang out in L.A. They're flying out from New York to see us play at a small club in Yorba Linda. So you get kind of cocky, like, yeah. you know. And uh, so, yeah, you know, we we went. And, and I think uh, Head, we played Soma with Sublime. And then there was the Seaport Ballroom on 2nd and PCH. Mm -hmm. We opened for Sublime there. That was cool. Um, and I only met Bradley a couple times real briefly, but. I was so full of social anxiety when I hung out of the show. I just wanted to get drunk and look for girls to make me feel better about myself, to mm. be honest. I didn't know it at the time. I yeah. thought I was partying. This is what band guys do. Uh, while my other bandmates were like meeting the drummer and having nice chats about where they surf or whatever. <laughs> I was just a madman and couldn't understand why people were like, dude. You're out of control. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're drinking beer. I'm drinking beer. Um, yeah, we we went. We got signed, put out a record, went on tour, and did that um, for a better part of a decade. And and all the while, I was trying to figure out how how can I control it and enjoy it, right? Like not overshoot the mark, not get too loaded, maintain respect, you know, handle my work. There's another saying that my buddy says is like, you know, we lower our expectations to meet our use. So 
all of a sudden I'm on tour and I'm like, you know, well, I don't get drunk before the show. I handle the show, I handle my business, but it's like, but yeah, but you're not writing and producing music anymore. You're not handling your life. You know, we can make excuses because we, Oh, I didn't get a DUI or you know what I mean? I didn't do anything bad. Right. But it's like, but, but what's all the amazing stuff you're not doing because you're too drunk or too loaded or fighting a hangover or detoxing. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, anyhow, eventually, as rock bands do, we fell apart over a girl and uh, bad decisions and couldn't fix it. No matter how, how hard we tried, I left head and that was a crushing blow because that um, felt like my baby. You know, I started that with Jared and we brought people in and I was producing our records. I mean, obviously, a band everybody brings their super important flavors to it but just how it felt for me emotionally it was like i worked so hard to put this band together and and uh and it was gone and then i didn't know who i was as a person so any bit of control i felt like i had for my habits went out the window i fell into like a depression without knowing it like lost my identity and then then i went back to drugs even harder you know, yeah. and uh, that, that, and that this time I'm working for my brother, he gave me a great job that I hated. <laughs> it taught me skills I needed to know because I didn't have any, helped me dry out my brain a little bit, but, uh, but I just couldn't handle that adjustment to the office. And so I was doing tons of drugs and trying to show up to work and that doesn't really go well. I don't know if anybody mm. out there has ever tried it, but doing <laughs> bad combination. And yeah. And showing up to an office job. It's not the best. And so I ended up in a, in a rehab um, because I was out of answers. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to go. Um, I thought maybe I should go ride elephants, take my last $2,000 and ride elephants in Thailand. I swear to God. And wow. then it hit me. It hit me what many talk about this moment of clarity and mine doesn't sound so profound, but it, it was like just the universe or whatever, like my highest self or whatever just said, you are out of control on the deepest level. And that sounds so obvious, but it was the first time that as I lay there in bed wondering what I'm going to do with my life and I just started bawling, like I'm out of control. Don't stop thinking that you have any control or any say in this. And so I had a what they call a surrender, right? Okay, mm -hmm. help me. Show me what the frick to do because I don't know. And and I went into a rehab thinking my problem was meth and heroin that I just was overshooting the mark. Maybe I could, you know, drink some margaritas and just smoke a little weed like everybody does. Right. And, uh, I, I was taught about this thing they talk about, um, in the big book of AA, which is the first time I hear it, heard it. And it was the allergy saying when I start, you know, drinking or putting anything in me, it sets off this phenomenon of craving and I'm different, like genetically, I'm different from other people. They don't have that experience and explained a lot because some nights when I was like, okay, I haven't partied in a while, I'll just go have a beer and I'd have a Corona. That ah, Corona's not my problem. I don't drink Coronas all day, every day. And I'll have a shot of Jaeger. And then I'd be off to the cocaine dealer's house doing cocaine. And I don't like cocaine explain that i put something on my body i want more and more and more and i lose all control mm -hmm. and then it also talked about how when i'm not loaded i i'm restless irritable and discontent like i just like, like sitting there by myself on the couch sounds like the worst thing ever you know and so then it always brings me back to pick up again so i couldn't stay stopped and then once i pick up i'm powerless and there goes the cycle all over and that i can relate to and uh then I heard other people share their story that sounded like mine or like they got it. And, um, and there was artists in these rooms that were getting sober and, uh, I had no other options. So I tried this process of the 12 steps. Um, I always share that. I remember this woman shared, she was a prostitute. She's like, I was sleeping in the park, shooting dope, turning tricks. And I did the 12 steps, went back to school and I got my degree and I met the man of my dreams. We have a family and loving family and kids. And now I run a law firm. I was like, what? Whoa. You did that from the 12 <laughs> steps? Okay, I'm going to try this shit. 
<laughs> and because I didn't want to just be sober, I wanted a good life. And if you're a right. musician, you know the struggle. You're on tour. Oh, I got 20 grand. Oh, I have no money. When's the next check coming from? You're hungover. You're dirty. And you're like, how is this life ever going to be sustainable? Mm. And I heard people who had not only a sustainable life, but a great life, as they say, beyond their wildest dreams. So I tried it. And I got the result they said I would get if I put in the effort that they put in. You know, I had to stay away from the party and friends. I had to move out of the old hood for a while. I had to, like, kind of isolate myself and keep myself safe so I didn't have temptation until I had enough of a transformation. And, uh, you know, my brother, who's a very smart, successful businessman who played music himself, he's like, dude, you know, forget the music you you went far enough you with head you went farther you know we were on mtv for a while and i think you went farther than most people just come work for me and let go of that stuff and i was like yeah you're so right but when i would go see a show it would hurt because i felt like the analogy i use is like if you imagine an athlete who's like oh this guy could be the next tom brady right and then a couple seasons in Seasons in, he blows out his knee. It's like, wow, that guy could have been some. I felt like that musically, yeah. like I, I got stripped of what I should have been. So I got really into prayer and meditation. I'm not a religious guy, but being desperate, I was just like, okay, if y'all talking about this prayer and meditation stuff all the time, I feel lost. And I started doing a lot of these all meditations for manifestation and at about Two years sober the second time because I relapsed at three just before three years because I stopped working on my recovery. Mm. The second time I said, Universe, I want to get back into music and then don't want it to be a shitty band. I'm not traveling in a van, it better be something good. I kid you not. And within 10 days, Corn was like, Hey, you want to come play with us? Wow. And what's cool about that is, you know, so many of us when we look at recovery, oh. Our life's over. And our brain tells us all these lies of what a sober or recovered life's going to be like. But it's like, well, how does your brain know that since you've never been sober? Right. Like, it's like, I, I know Texas is going to suck. Have you been to Texas? No. I just know it's going <laughs> to suck. Okay, you sound like a five-year-old. You know what I mean? I don't like that. Why, Jimmy? I just don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so... <laughs> The thing is that Corn reached out to me because the guy they had at the time, Brian Head Welch had left for a number of years. The guy they had at the time playing in his spot was new to the world of touring and just drinking and lying about it. And so they reached out to me because they heard I was sober. So my brain's like, music's over. You can't do music sober. And my brother, super intelligent, said the same thing, like, let it go. But my heart and soul was like, no. And if I'm a musician and it's in my soul, why being sober should I have to let go of what I love so dearly? And then it was actually my recovery and sobriety that led me to the corn gig because I wouldn't have prayed and meditated before. But yeah, I don't, I don't know anybody else out there, but I don't think there's a lot of people on meth that meditate. Could be wrong. Probably not. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and I got to tour the world, you know, totally sober at the highest level, you know. And uh, and then so people are like, oh, man, wasn't that hard? No, because I had a I had a recovery. I didn't have a I'm just going to stay away from it and hide. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just going to try to go to the places that my ex-girlfriend isn't at. I had recovery through the 12 steps that made it so I didn't want to drink or use anymore. Mm. And then and then I went to meetings in. Hong Kong and Australia and, you know, India. I went, I went to support group meetings all around the world to stay connected. And then, then I started meeting guys, you know, um, in all sorts of bands. I won't blast them on their anonymity, but all sorts of bands that were out there sober, you know. And then so we're on tour and it'd be Corn and a few other uh, bands in an arena and we'd make our own meetings and support each other through this thing and you just kind of realize when the student's ready the teachers appear right mm, yeah yeah so that's what I did and then uh, do you want to interject in here should I shut up for a second do we have no this is great 
Okay. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're making it, you're making it easy. You know, I will say that as, as you started talking, I thought to myself, like, it, it's, it's got to be difficult going back into music and staying sober. But listening to your passion and how badly you needed the music, it sounds like going back to the music made you so much happier. Probably made it easier in your in your recovery. Yeah, it's it's interesting because there's different ways of recovery for everybody. There's different things people are fighting, but very simply for me, when I was in that big book of AA, even though I thought my problem was drugs, and by the way, alcohol is a drug; it just happens to be liquid in a bottle. <laughs> so to me, it's all drugs. So, but but what I heard in that book was very simply summarize what it's like to be an alcoholic i saw and pe some people are like well i'm into like science okay you want to do science science says i have a hypothesis if i rub two sticks together it'll get hot enough to make fire that can i prove that can i do it over and over yes i can i have now proved that well the 12 steps showed me that there was people like me who when they did this process had this experiment so therefore it's science on some level Mm -hmm. I did the 12 step experiment. I got the result. And so I just, and it's a design for living. I also stopped working my program at two years or so, and I went back to getting loaded. So what I learned is I have to apply this to my daily life. And in so doing, there's a lot of uh, what they call the promises in this program of recovery. And one of it is, it says that at this point, the problem will be removed. We won't be cocky, nor will we be afraid. We will recoil from alcohol as if we were recoiling from a hot flame. And that was my experience. Like, uh, you know, I'm not, I never say I'll never use again because that's not true. If I start screwing off and doing shady stuff and feel horrible about myself, I'll get loaded. Um, but I'm also not scared. I know that if I keep doing what I need to do, stay connected to the people like me who are staying sober, then I'm in a place of neutrality, right? And I can function in this world. And then, you know, the most difficult part for me as an artist, or I think probably anybody is finding myself again. So like, you know, you get, I, to over-dramatize it, I felt kind of church boy. Like, I don't want to cuss. I don't want to be a jerk because, you know, I'm, I'm changing, right? I'm trying to not be a selfish jerk who lies and cheats and steals and all these things that we tend to do when we're druggy alcoholics. But then I'm like, afraid to cuss it's like come on i gotta drop the f-bomb so in like music and how am i as an artist who's sober how do i play in a drum machine you know what i mean how do i go to disneyland and not drop mescaline you know mm -hmm. so you kind of have to find yourself again and it's tough and it takes time but that's different from being afraid that i'm gonna drink and use so for people who maybe want to go out there and they're just like i'm just not gonna drink or use and what we call white knuckle it. Yeah, that works for some, but that sounds horrible to me. Yeah. I've got like so many friends who are amazing artists and in the music industry that have had the same deadly challenges that I've had. And we have this bond that's on such a deeper level than the average humor. Hey, bro, what's up, dude? Eh. Like, you know what I mean? That superficial <laughs> stuff. We're like deep. We're like, like people who've been in the war together we get each other right. like, dude yeah you know what i mean and that bond is a very special bond and i just you know my spirituality kind of lies you know in in certain concepts outside of any church or theology which is like i'm not sent here to suffer if i feel like i'm called to music i'm not supposed to go on tour and hate it and feel so alone and like i just oh my god i want to drink so bad i just don't believe in that i do believe in like the brotherhood of the soul and the spirit where we can like i'm meant to be here and so are you let's let's support each other you know what i mean yes it's just it's like this all-encompassing world I, you know like if we if we ask for it it will come you know and so one one other thing i want to talk about is like you know people your recovery somebody's recovery can be as shitty as they say it is it sucks i hate meetings i hate recovery okay that's what you're gonna get i went the opposite and i like to be a voice for the opposite being sober can be as amazing as i make it i mm. now every day 
work hard on being a better person. I'm going to fuck up. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to hurt people's feelings. But if, if you're in a, in recovery and you're doing it the way we do it, you're, you're trying to like own where you're messing up and do better next time and see where your blind spots are, see where the mistakes are. And in that case, you're continually evolving and trying Mm -hmm. to evolve and wanting to evolve. And then you're connecting with other people who are doing that. Well, guess what? A lot of the world, they don't want to change. They don't want to grow. They don't want to evolve. They're going to keep banging their head. They're never going to face their family trauma. They're never going to face their addiction. They're just going to, and that's okay. They have the right to choose that. Right. But in the realm of recovery, I have the ability to choose limitless growth and expansion. And in so doing, I get to surround myself with those kind of people. And then that's kind of where I want to live. I have to, I, I'm sensitive energetically. So when I get around people who are just bitching and moaning and complaining, I'm like, uh uh-uh, uh, I ain't going there. It's easy to yeah. fall into that. But fuck all that. <laughs> Pardon my language. Right. I had to, yeah, I I had to feel into that right there. So <laughs> the rest of my story is the corn gig was going away. Brian's coming back to the band. I felt like, oh, thanks, God. Now I want to be a broke sober <laughs> musician again. Thanks a lot. At like, I don't know what I was, 40, 38, 40, 42. I have no idea. Um, so again, I had to go back to my practices. And so instead of falling in self-pity, I was like, all right, universe, God, Buddha, head of lettuce, whatever you are, aliens from the Pleiadian, gal- Pleiadian galaxy. <laughs> I'm clearly supposed to be sober. I clearly feel I'm supposed to be a musician. I'm not supposed to be here to suffer, I don't think. So how can I help people and make a living? And mm-hmm. that was a big difference because never in my life, they talk about addicts are so selfish and self-centered, not meaning we don't give presents to people or give them a ride. It means we're thinking about ourselves all the time. <laughs> and, you know, it's always me, me, me. Did I say something stupid? How's my hair? What else? Oh, what about me? I need more money. I need a car. Does she like me? Do you like me? It's always, you know what I mean? Thinking about me. Mm-hmm. We get in a recovery and we learn that like our job is to bring something into the world, not take, take, take. And, you know, and when you're in a band, it's like, hey, want to buy a t-shirt? Do you like my song? Want to come to my show? How do you think? Did I play good? Do I look good? It's like, you know, it just right. gets you stuck in that, you know, needing to be validated from the outside world but we learned that like you know our job is to go how can i be of service to the world with the gifts and attributes i have so universe if i'm supposed to be sober a musician how do i help people make a living oh when i was in rehab i remember being with 22 dudes old dudes young dudes every kind of dude alcoholic junkies And we're all full of like shame and guilt and low self-esteem and insecurity and anxiety and dope sickness. And we do our, you know, sessions. And then I would grab my guitar and just twang a couple chords and the room would transform. Not because Mm. I'm such a great player, trust me. Because energetically. (laughs) Maybe a little bit of that. (laughs) Energetically, yeah, it would transform. And I would literally like, just being silly, I'd be like... And do that, and everybody would start dancing silly cowboy dances. Mm. And it would bring them together. So 22 guys in a rehab, you got clicks. You got like, you know, these guys over here. You're like, that guy's my homie. You're like, that guy's a weirdo. Screw that guy. I ain't talking to him. But the music would tear down all the walls, and people would just come out and start doing silly cowboy dances. Mm. When do guys do silly cowboy dances without being (laughs) drunk? You know? And so what drug can do that? What pill can you give anybody who's struggling with all those things I just said that makes them just lighten up and dance and get in their body and like, you know, and so the idea was to bring music into treatment centers and, um, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I've, I've always been like a songwriter. And so I thought I'll go in and try to write songs with people. I, I had a very rough idea and I pitched it and pitched it and pitched it for six months and finally got a bite and uh, started doing it. I founded the org on 12, 12 of 12. So clearly I got some magical numerology going for mm-hmm. me. But uh, yeah, I started bringing instruments and music into treatment centers and, and uh, I was terrified. I almost, when they hired me, I was almost like, I can't do this. <laughs> wow. But I did it. And even in my first session, the, the universe gave me this gift. This guy came in late 
We call him Mr. Pink. Came in late to session, and he's like, F this, F that, why, guitars, I'm a junkie, I'm going to die on the streets, why is there music here, I need to get sober, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I was like, I get it, man, but check it out, here's my idea, I used to do drugs, the same drugs you did, you know, we're writing this song together, here's the lyrics, and the lyrics we're talking about, you know, being a junkie and all this kind of stuff. And I gave him a little pink shaker looks like a baby rattle because that's all the instruments i had left and i showed him here's our verse we break it down here come back in and here's how you shake it you know, ch -ch 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 <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. and he's like okay i can just try this and in a few minutes this is a guy who is physically ill dope sick which is like having covid but you can't sleep basically yeah. just hating life and in a few minutes he's like yeah how, wait how many times does a verse go okay three times then back here okay cool oh, wow. and he started dancing around i was like wait a second <laughs> so this guy who's like suicidal is now dancing. And at the end, he's like, I don't even feel dope sick anymore. Are you coming wow. back next week? I said, yeah. And I was like, okay, that's a little bit more than I thought this thing could even do. And that was the experience, you know, so clients, you know, a therapist walks by, you got Jim, the drunken mailman who's 70, who won't talk to anybody. And then he's like singing his brains out in some song we wrote. And the therapist mm -hmm. is like, how did you get Jim singing? He won't even <laughs> open up to me. You know, and, and we put our heart and soul in the lyrics. We sing about what we're going through. And so fast forward, we're coming up on our, you know, we're in our 10th year. Our 10 year anniversary will be 12, 12 of 22. And we do about 600 sessions a month now. Wow. And we, we have a nonprofit too, so we can give away sessions and we have a contract with the Department of Defense that's, uh, we're now in our fifth year, I think, the COVID time warps kind of making mm. it foggy, but uh, um, they fly us around to work with wounded veterans, you know, and uh, what a gift that is. You, you, yeah. think, you, you think how these, uh, you know, heroes of our nation are willing to give it all to keep us free so we can play on our iPhones all day and complain mm. about you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, for an ex tweaker who got kicked out of school and was so lost and, you know, you're asking the universe, how do I help people? And I get to go work with veterans on this level. And on top of that, give other musicians, my sober musicians, friends, uh, you know, jobs, a career yeah. that fills them in their heart. And that's what I call the vortex of radness. So mm. they'll go do a session, get so high off of the experience they have seeing other people transform. I get a high off of watching their high and we're just sharing it back and forth between each other. It's, what, it's like the vortex of radness, right? It's, yeah. That's what I call it. And it's, it's the greatest gift. It's all because of recovery and, and having people, you know, being open and letting people show me the way. That's remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> That's remarkable. And and I have to say, I before you were even on the board, I was exposed to Rock to Recovery. A close family member was in a program and Rock to Recovery would come in every week. And it was something that he looked forward to. It was it was the only thing in his entire week <clears throat> in the entire program that that he looked forward to because music is just so powerful and can can reach you in a different way than than other things and so i was already just loving the the mission and and what you guys were doing and so it was for me on a personal level it was really cool to to be able to have you be on the board of the Noel family foundation knowing that you're already doing such great work um and and obviously have been for so long and and then of course since then i've had the pleasure of meeting some of the people that work with you and um, I just have so much respect for that. And you also put out a book last year. Tell us about the book. Yeah. Well, first I got to say, again, there was a time where nobody wanted to hear a word I had to say. And, you know, self-esteem was non-existent. And so to even be asked to get to help in any little way, what the Dole family foundation is doing is the greatest honor and a privilege, um, you know, so so thank you for that and all the great work you're doing and uh, hot work. At, you know, you all are working hard to make a difference out out there. And, and so yeah, that's just like you. fills my heart so much. 
and like put on this podcast and now you got you know you're doing a lot for the community um so that's cool um Thanks. yeah so the yeah thank you the the book is uh you know so i'm co- i'm going in these rehabs going into a little room and watching these transformations and going who's seeing this you know and i've always wanted to document it somehow and then i met a uh, phd through our work she was working at one of the high-end treatment centers in la who actually was a writer and actually worked in the music industry uh dr constance sharf and and i was telling her like you know should we get some money and do like a study and she's like let's write a book so we interviewed 18 people who had well i'm my story's in there too mm-hmm. uh, a brief one, version <laughs> shorter than <laughs> this version this kid a bridged, but, um, a bridged version <laughs> yeah yeah oh is that what that word means I that's what that is <laughs> <laughs> so she's like let's write a book and we interviewed you know every demographic you know not just drug addicts but sex trafficking and old and young and lgbtq and and they tell their story of transformation that we are a part of and going back to what you said is you know in recovery it's never one thing right that it, right. it's it's a it's a community effort you know we have to come at it from so many angles and so in these stories we're one of the components that really helped and you know like you're saying when we're in rehab yeah rock recovery has the gets to be oftentimes the one thing people get excited about uh, mm-hmm. while they're in there dealing with so much or whatever and some people don't like it on on occasion uh but it's this you know it has to be like a swiss army knife approach because you just never know when you're gonna get somebody to like open up their eyes or ears or heart or whatever to grab onto recovery a little more firmly and uh so that that's you know what the book's about basically i love the the subtitle music as a catalyst for human transformation it's powerful. Yeah, I came up with that. Not very bad for good. a guy who barely graduated high school. <laughs> very good. Uh, yeah, thank you. That that that's that's what it is, you know. And uh, my dream is that you know, rock to recovery will. will I'm not going to be around forever. Can live on and have made an impact to help proliferate the use of playing music as a healing force in the world. And uh, you know. One thing I like to say is like when we're in groups, let's say you're in a rehab and they come in and like music instruments, you know, 80% of the people are like, I don't play, I don't sing. What the F are you doing here? It's like, well, wait, hold on a second. Where did music come from? Did a caveman walk through the jungle and a piano fell out of the sky and he <laughs> cracked his knuckles, started playing Chopin? You know what I mean? Was there a tribe in that way? <laughs> yeah yeah totally you know was was there you know i don't know but the point is it was a a communal thing it was a societal thing it was a tribal thing and dancing around the fire beating on drums and making rudimentary instruments and it was just a form of expression and i'm guessing that when the original humanoids or whatever uh you know neanderthals were were messing around with early incarnations of music they were like hey hey Gunter, you're a little off key right there. Can you, you know what I mean? They didn't care. And so my point is pop music has stolen, pop culture has stolen music from the the average human. Right. People are like, well, if I don't sound like, you know, Beyonce, I suck. And you hear that a lot in groups. Oh, I'm no good. I don't have talent. It's like, yes, you do. And yeah. we're not supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to use it as, as expression, right? you know? And, and that's, that's really what my dream is, is that we can get back to like just using music as a healing force. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are you working on now? You've got your band Human. Got my band Human for the very small percentage of people that might actually try to look us up. We are, it's found by H-U-3-M-3-N. We're fancy on the spelling just to make it so we can grow no fan base and nobody can ever find our music. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, after it's doing good rock stuff. 
<laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm blessed to have some talented guys come into my life and they have a saying, don't die with the songs in you. And uh, mm. I wasn't a writer when I was with Korn and I, I've always loved to create musical experiences for people. And so, um, yeah, we got Matthew Bartosh of vocals and Clinton who plays um, with DI and uh, uh, right now we're playing with Zach who's a drummer he used to play with Dorothy and Ugly Kid Tro he's just an amazing drummer and we had Scott in there from Train for a while um, just like Spinal Tap you go through drummers mm -hmm. a lot um, <laughs> one has not exploded on the throne yet though so that's good, good. but yeah um, that's good <laughs> Yeah, so we got songs coming out. We're on we're on Spotify. You know, we're doing the drip drip song at a time thing, and we got a show. Um, well, we probably already played. When when does this thing air? On Wednesday. The Wednesday, second, okay. 2nd. Yes. Okay. Well, that means we will have just played the Viper Room January thirty first, but we got a show ah. at Tiki Bar in Costa Mesa uh, on Saturday, February twenty sixth. And if you awesome. come there, anybody who comes to the show, I will personally give you a foot massage. <laughs> that that is not true. I will never touch your feet. You're about to get some freaky ass messages, boy. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. People have foot fetishes, huh? How, how about this? If you come to the show, I will let you take pictures of my naked feet. Oh, there you go. Now you're going to have a sellout. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a trick. That is the life hack. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story with us. It's so um, inspirational and encouraging. And, and I love the fact that, you know, you don't sugarcoat that there is work involved, but it's so worth it. You know, you're, we're in this life and we're either going to have a good one or a shitty one. And we do have some say in, and how that goes. And so I think you're a perfect example of that, of just, you know, being willing to put in the work and go after it and seek out ways to have a good life and, you know, develop a positive association and community. And, um, and I do think 12 step programs are so vital for that. And, and you're a great example of that. So very proud of thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're so sweet. Well, you know, in the old days, people maybe fought dragons or were knights and had courage like that. Today's warrior has the courage to face their own demons, and that mm. can be much scarier. You know yes. what I mean? To, to, it's a lot easier sometimes to fight out in the physical realm than to go and do the inner work. And I right. love what you said. We have a choice. And the thing is, is that there's people who are sicker, richer, poorer more trauma, less trauma that have recovered. Yeah. So there's no excuse. It's there for everybody. We just got to do the work, like you said. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. I know we've been trying to make this happen for a long time, but I do think the timing is going to be perfect. Um, perfect. The day after this airs, of course, we have a, a special show going on in Long Beach, and DJ Product is going to be uh, spinning between sets so very timely Wait. for you to mention yeah i love him he's just so great so great. um thank you for everything you do in rock to recovery and the no family foundation and just setting a phenomenal example of being a sober musician it is possible and it's so worth it thank you very much for coming on the show thank you it's an honor and a privilege man it was awesome chatting with wes i i I think you might have asked like a question and he gave us the most incredible story that maybe we've ever heard on this podcast. It's up there for me. It was fantastic. Clearly he's no uh, stranger to telling his story, but I've heard bits and pieces of it. I went to his book signing last year and, you know, heard a little bit, but you know, it's interesting when you know somebody, but have never really heard their story. And now I have so much more of an appreciation for who he is and what he's done. I, you know, I respected him before, but just so much more now. He really has has come through a lot and has a great perspective on things. Yeah, anytime we can uh, we can hear stories like that because I think it's so important for all of us to remember, and you know, especially those that are in recovery. But even if you're not, um, you know, there's just times where you're feeling like shit or things maybe aren't going great, and to know that you can turn it around and accomplish so much, I think it's just. 
uh, I, I love hearing those kind of stories. Absolutely. And great timing. As I mentioned, we have our show coming up tomorrow, which is Thursday, February 3rd. I'm so excited about the show in Long Beach at Alex's bar. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about it, Jared? This was kind of, kind of your baby, right? You know, Kelly, I, it's so funny because I've played a lot of fantasy sports in my life, like fantasy football, fantasy basketball, and I get to make these fantasy lineups. And um, when I came to you and brought up the idea of, of doing something, you know, before Cali Vibes to benefit the foundation, um, and you kind of just let me run with it a little bit, and I got a chance to put together my, my grandest fantasy lineup of all. Hmm. Um, and, uh, this is something that's just going to be an absolute treat. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen it on social media. Um, but happening in at Alex's is the long beach legends and legacies show. Um, at just, it's overwhelming when we reached out how many people were willing to be a part of this. So, um, of course we've got, uh, Rast one who's coming out with his band, um, we've got Pero Bravo, um, you know, Miguel, you just can't have the night without him. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and Eric Wilson's new project, Spray Allen, um, they're going to come out and play. And then, of course, Jacob and Billy um, playing some sublime songs. And that's something that I think we're all looking forward to. Uh, this is a night that for a sublime fan, for a music fan, for somebody from Long Beach, for somebody who appreciates this scene and the fact that all the proceeds go to the Knoll Family Foundation, uh, this is like an epic event that cannot be missed. Uh, and I couldn't be any more excited for it and, uh, and grateful for you and, uh, and the foundation and kind of letting me start to put this together. And, and now here we are. It's a real thing. Yeah, I'm really stoked. I'm looking forward to it. I love all those people that are playing. I'm super excited and grateful for Jacob and Billy. You know, they're both incredible musicians in their own right. And so for them to come together and agree to play some sublime music for us to benefit the foundation is really, really special. It's, it's not something they've ever done. And, um, so, yeah, and then, as you mentioned, all the bands are are donating their performances. Um, it's just going to be a really incredible night. I've already heard from people that are flying all the way across the country just to come to this show. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a small venue, only 300. So I'm, I'm really excited. And I know the people that come are going to be super stoked, too. And we are working on getting someone to, to film it. So hopefully that will work out. And uh, we'll have it around for, for posterity because it's going to be a really historic night. You know what? And I totally forgot to mention, and you did mention it in, in the podcasts as well, but of course, DJ Product will be out at Alex's as well. Yes. Um, and again, it's just, you know, for me as a, as a Sublime fan, and obviously for you uh, being Brad's sister, um, to have all of these people under one roof in one night um, for the support. I mean, these are people that were instrumental in the Sublime sound. Obviously, Miguel and Eric, I mean, Sublime members. Um, but, you know, people like DJ Product and, and Rast One. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's amazing that everybody's going to be under one roof and that we are able to, to put something like this together. It, it's super special. Absolutely. And of course, that's a lead in to Cali Vibes, which is happening Friday through Sunday, February 4th through 6th in Long Beach. We're going to have a booth there. So if you're at the show, make sure you stop by the booth and say hi. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have some merch out there, uh, all sorts of uh, cool information. I'm super pumped for Cali Vibes. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we're going to be at the booth and that we're going to be hanging out and talking to people because they put out these set times and so many amazing bands are overlapping. There's going to be some decisions that are going to have to get made uh, by, by a lot of festival goers out there in, in Long Beach, but um, just awesome to be able to get back out and, and have music festivals and be able to get to live music and, and see everybody. And I'm uh, I couldn't be any more excited about it. And, you know, of course it, it's like uh three below zero today here in buffalo so 
getting out of that as well is something that I am, I am very much looking forward to. Um, for those of you who are not able to make it out to Cali Vibes and check out the awesome merch that we will have available, you're still in luck. You can visit the nolfamilyfoundation.org or you can click on the link tree that Anna will include in the description of this show. That'll get you to all things Noel Family Foundation. You can find out how you can pick up a shirt, a hat, um, the uh, pins that were put out for the anniversary of the house that Bradley built, uh, are all sorts of cool ways that you guys can get awesome merch and help support the Noel Family Foundation and getting Bradley's house up and open again. That's the whole reason why we're doing this podcast. Um, so go ahead and, uh, and check all of that out. Make sure wherever you're listening to this, you're subscribing. Click that subscribe button. It goes a long way. Share it with a friend or a family member. Um, if you like the show, go ahead and leave comments. Kelly and I see them all the time, and they do go a long way, and they mean a lot to us. So other than that, Kelly, we're just like a few days away, and then I'm wheels up and, and on my way to, to California. It's crazy. I'm so excited for you and Anna to come out here. I so appreciate the help for the booth and for the show. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great time. I would cut my beating heart out to go to that show. So I wouldn't have missed it. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Um, I, I can assure you of that. So uh, super excited and look forward to uh, seeing everybody out there as well. Now, Kelly, at the end of every show, we always let our listeners leave on a high note. We play some music. What's everybody going to be hearing today? I think it's only fitting for us to end with a song by Wes's latest project, Human. It's called Edging, but of course the E is a three. It's a great song. They've got a, a really great sound and I'm excited for everybody to hear it. So here's Edging by Human. Hope you guys enjoy. Until next week, I'm Jared Orr. She's Kelly Noel. We are out of time. You don't have to go home, but it's time to leave Bradley's house. <laughs> <laughs>